passar pelo ribeiro. Queridos amigos, bienvenidas y bienvenidos a este encuentro, esta conversación con Steve Reich dentro del Festival de las Artes de Castilla y León y del Instituto de Investigaciones Artísticas Catarina Gurska. Eh, es un placer estar con todos vosotros y vosotras. Mi nombre es Luis Ángel de Benito, de Radio Clásica, Radio Nacional de España. Y bueno, es un inmenso honor tener con nosotros al maestro Steve Reich. Hello, Steve Wright, how are you? Hi, very well, thank you. How is the weather in New York? Well, actually, I'm 50 miles north of New York and the sun is shining and it's quite beautiful. <laughs> okay, okay, we can take advantage of this. Muy bien. Pues quizá lo sabéis muchos y muchas de vosotros, Steve Wright eh, fue denominado recientemente como el pensador musical más original de nuestro tiempo por el New Yorker y entre los más grandes compositores del siglo por el New York Times. Tiene un Grammy, tiene un premio Pulitzer, también tiene la medalla de oro de la, de la música por la American Academy of Arts and Letters, también tiene el Integral de Tokio, el Polar Music Prize, y aquí en España eh, le dimos, vamos a ponerlo en primera persona del, del plural, el premio BBVA Fronteras del Conocimiento 2013. Eh, how do you feel uh, about this, Steve Wright? Because Arbo, Arbo, Part, Arbo Part received this uh, prize yesterday. How, how do you feel about that? I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, uh, I have a tremendous regard to Arvo Pert. Uh, he, uh, for me, is a great composer in Europe, and I have felt that way for 40 years. So I'm, I, I'm very grateful that you, you gave it to me, and I'm very proud to do, that Arvo Pert will join also. Congratulations to him. Congratulations to you. <laughs> Y a usted, Elder Wright. Eh, eh, Gracias. Steve Wright. Muy bien. Pues estupendo. Tenemos con nosotros, a, en fin, a dos intérpretes eh, de lujo. En España tenemos a Pedro Pablo Cámara. Bienvenido, Pedro Pablo. Hola, saxofonista. Buenas. ¿Qué tal está? Saxofonista, él ha participado en mil festivales internacionales, podéis consultar su currículum eh, en la, la Orquesta Filarmónica de Suiza, la Europea, la Orquesta de la Academia de Festival de Lucerna, Orquesta de la Radio de Frankfurt, la Mahler Chamber Orchestra, trabajando con Simon Rattle, con Pablo Eras Casado, etc. Estamos muy honrados de que estés con nosotros. Pedro. Buenas tardes, Luis Ángel. Muchas gracias. Un placer. Y tenemos a Juanjo Guillén, que muy conocido en el mundo de la percusión. Él es solista, es músico de orquesta, es profesor, compositor, productor, muy polifacético. Y bueno, actualmente es el director artístico y fundador de Neopercusión. También está dirigiendo los ciclos madrileños, Ritmo Vital, Connect Arte Sonoro, Agora Actual, etc., etc. Y es profesor solista de la Orquesta Nacional de España. Bienvenido, Juanjo Guillén. Gracias, bienvenidos a todos igualmente. Muy bien. Pues si queréis, eh, if you feel well, Steve Wright, we can start to to do some questions and uh, this is an informal uh, uh, encounter. Muy bien. Muy bien. Okay, uh, I can start and If you have questions or you have something to add, uh, Juanjo and Pablo and Pedro Pablo, we can you can uh, participate in in the question. Muy bien. Okay, Mr. Wright, you are known and beloved for your magical driving of sound repetition, the spiral rather than cycles in your music. New York Counterpoint would be a magnificent example of the music you created in the 1980s. Did you reflect a gradual creation process here through the adding or through the growing of the elements, the themes, the musical motifs? 
Could you define this work uh, like uh, this uh, gradual creation process? Well, uh, New York Counterpoint was the second of the Counterpoint pieces. Uh, the first one was called Vermont Counterpoint for flute. And what happened was uh, the flutist Ransom Wilson called me on the telephone in, I guess, 1980 and said, would you write me a flute concerto? And I said, no, <laughs> because I'm not interested in the idea of a soloist versus an orchestra. Uh, I'm interested always in ensemble work. And then after I hung up the phone, I thought to myself, this is crazy. Here is this wonderful musician, and all I can say is no. So I began to think uh, about um, what I had done in the 1960s with the, say, violin phase, where one player records themselves and then again and again and then plays back live against the recording. And I thought, well, I'm, I called Ransom Wilson, the flute is back on the phone, and I said, look, Ransom, would you consider uh, recording yourself on flute and also alto flute to make it a little bit lower and piccolo to make it a little bit higher and then later playing back live in the concert hall against these pre-recordings and to my surprise he said yes i'd love to so that piece happened oh several years later i got a telephone call from richard stoltzman very famous clarinetist, you probably know him. And he, he asked also, <laughs> and the same situation happened. Uh, the clarinet uh, uh, is an instrument that, that has been very, uh, particularly the bass clarinet, has a very big role in music for 18 musicians, very, uh, very famous piece of mine. And um, the B-flat clarinet is also in music for 18 musicians. And uh, because of those two instruments have a very big range of sound from low to high, uh, it was a very attractive uh, possibility. So uh, I, I, I wrote uh, the, the piece uh, primarily, primarily as a solo piece for a soloist to play with pre-recorded accompaniment as a kind of new kind of recital piece. And most of the time, that is what is played. But sometimes, uh, particularly in schools, it is done with all live players. Um, and it, it depends. Generally speaking, the solo version is better because the ensemble is better. Okay. Okay, uh, so the, um, this is what you describe in some interviews about the gradual process of creation is manifest in this work, in the repetitions, in the growing of the elements in this work? No, I think you are, you are, uh, you are stopping me in 1968 and saying here in 2020 <laughs> or 1980, you must be the same person. Sorry. <laughs> Music as a Gradual Process is an essay that I wrote about my own music in 1968. And it's a very good description of what I did in 1968 and before. It is not a manifesto. I don't like manifestos. I like people who figure oh, out what has oh, to happen oh, as it happens and plan ahead. So, uh, oh, okay. But, but generally speaking, look, generally speaking, the rate of change in New York Counterpoint is relatively slow. The harmonies, which you hear at the very beginning of the piece, are, go slowly from one to the other. And generally speaking, you stay in a certain key for a good long time and then move. Sometimes it moves back and forth more rapidly because it was 20 years later. Uh, But uh, in other words, when you are young, you have certain ideas and they become very formative. They, 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 they set you in motion. 
But if you are not a machine, you grow and you change. And so those ideas also grow and they change. So uh, uh, okay. let's say uh, New York counterpoint is a big difference from let's say violin phase. Wouldn't be more different. So violin phase is strictly music as a gradual process. New York counterpoint is a slowly changing, harmonically varied, uh, much more melodically uh, rich piece. So I prefer New York counterpoint. <laughs> yes, yes, of course, of course. Of course. Perhaps I prefer to uh, counterpoint. Okay. One more question uh, before my friends can, can participate. Would it be possible to consider New York counterpoint, uh, counterpoint um, like a um, um, revision of a three movement sonata? In any way, first movement with introduction and, and fast movement, uh, two, a slow and more um, uh, melodic movement, and three, ludic and festive movement. Uh, or do you prefer not to propose this uh, association with old forms? No, the idea, you, you are quite right. I mean, uh, I would not use the word sonata at all, but I mean, uh, fast, slow, fast, let's go to Scarlatti and before Scarlatti. I mean, this is Scarlatti, very, yeah, old, yeah. very yeah. old thinking, you know, very, very good, uh, well-established <laughs> way of, of making music. So I, I am doing the same thing. I salute Scarlatti, absolutely. I salute every, all Baroque composers. <laughs> so uh, in that, of course, is, 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 the, the, that separation, is, it, it, it We like it. We, the human race, <laughs> like it that way. So in that sense, yes. I, I don't think Sonata conjures up the idea, first theme, second theme, develop and recapitulate. That does not apply. But the basic idea of a uh, fast movement, uh, followed by a slow movement, followed by... A, but again, this, the, the slow movement is exactly half the tempo of the first movement, and the yeah, yeah. last movement resumes the exact same tempo as the first. That is more uh, 20th century thinking. So uh, basically, the answer to your question is yes, but. <laughs> Thank you. I feel very comfortable with you. <laughs> okay, good. That's that's the most important thing. <laughs> okay. Okay, Juanjo Guillem, do you want to ask the maestro some of your questions? Yes, very happy to to speak with you, Mr. Wright. It's a, it's a honor to be. Well, um, my interest is a percussionist interest uh, when I work. Your pieces, my first piece I played when I was 15 years old, I played six marimbas. It ah. was a very emotional thing because I never played some, yes, because um, I, I didn't have the habit to repeat so many times. And <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I'm a play, I said, What I'm doing now? Why I'm repeating so many times? <laughs> <laughs> And my teacher says to me, "You have to repeat to find a lot of interesting things while you're repeating." So I, it was an emotion for me to play his music. Now we are playing in uh, in two weeks, Mallet Quartet, uh, Mallet Quartet. And I have technical question for you because. I speak sometimes with different colleagues, and some, day, some of them tell me, no, Maestro says, uh, you have to use this kind of mallet, you have to use this kind of, uh, uh, you know, plastic or something like that. So my question is about which kind of sound you would like to have in the instruments in mallet quartet, like for the marimbas, for example, which is a very open instrument about mallet. Okay, uh, very good question. Um, in Mallet Quartet, the marimbas are basically, uh, there are two marimbas, and they are both playing uh, interlocking patterns. They 
playing the same pattern in different rhythmic positions, same notes against each other. Uh, and they are setting up, if you like, a complicated accompaniment for the vibraphones. Uh, the, the, the mallets that I prefer uh, are a, a medium hard, medium, medium hey, rubber hey, mallet hey. again. Uh, it doesn't mean that, the, that you or any percussionist anywhere might decide, well, you know, I, it also depends on the room you are in. Uh, if a room is very reverberant, a lot of reverb, then the rubber mallets really should be used. In a room that is more seco, more dry, you might want to say, well, I like the sound of these particular wound, these nylon or cotton wound mallets. It's a richer sound for me, and I can still hear everything because the room is so clear. Uh, so any good musician plays the instrument, and he plays the room, too, <laughs> as you know. Uh, the vibraphones are the solos, so to speak. They have the melodic material also playing in canon with each other. And they need a fairly hard mallet. Not too hard, you, can, you don't want to hurt your ear. Because if you play a vibraphone with a really hard mallet, it, <laughs> it, it, you don't want to do that. So uh, 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 again, you know, in the score, I, I specify medium hard mount, wound mallet to give you a, a, a general picture. But the real decision is your decision or whoever is playing the piece. When my ensemble was playing, we, we have certain mallets we use, but if in a different, different situation, we have to play differently at different mallets. So uh, when I, again, I would say basically for the rub, medium, medium hard rubber mallets for the marimbas, uh, medium hard wound the mallets for the vibraphones. But this is just general the real decision that I want. I want you to play the piece, okay. I want you to love the piece, and I want, you, I want you to love the piece, and I want you to interpret the piece as comes to you as you're playing. Because otherwise, who cares? <laughs> uh, about feeling, I have a, about the feeling, I have to, yeah, one question. I, when I play with the African musicians, First time when I played, I, I thought, why they are going so forward? <laughs> so forward? Forward tempo, you know. Uh, and when we finish, we stay in the same tempo that the, be the beginning. I said, how is possible? We are going forward, forward, and we are in the same tempo. So, yeah. is that the idea for your pieces, for this piece, for, for Malacuarte? Uh, for many of the very, very rhythmic pieces, uh, my sense of time is that you, you don't rush. That's, that's a mistake if you get faster and faster. But do you play the beat like this or like this or like that? Do you play it behind the beat, right on the beat, or ahead of the beat? I think for me, forward, but you're leaning forwards. You're leaning forwards. You're leaning ahead. Old style jazz, like in New York Counterpoint, the feeling is like a backbeat. You're a little back behind the beat. It's a 1920s, 1930s jazz feeling, which is which Richard Stoltzman liked to play. The clarinetist who first did the piece. Uh, so, but for the percussion pieces, I think you have it exactly right. It's, you are playing, and people who play right on the beat, it's very mechanical. It's not interesting to playing up and down, up and down, up and down. So you, the idea that you're leaning forward, but never rushing, that's wonderful. Congratulations again. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, before Pedro Pablo, one more question. Master Wright, um, is important for, your, for you the communication with real people, real audiences, because the elements, the primary material of in your musics and in, in your most uh, famous uh, works, 
is tonal melodies or uh, melodic modules or tonal isolate, isolated chords like you do in mallet quarter, for example, uh, just smooth chords, for example. Is it important for you, the, the contact with, the, with real people? Absolutely, yes. And now I must tell you a story about your own country. It was 1972, and there was the first major international arts festival in Pamplona. Luis de Pablo ran it. And I was invited with my ensemble to play drumming and other pieces. And they put us in uh, to play drumming. They put us in a basketball court. <laughs> or outdoor field, maybe it was an outdoor field. And I would say the audience was maybe thousands of people, maybe 200 music critics and uh, cognoscenti, and everybody else was just people from Pamplona. And, and we, <laughs> musicians, we looked and we thought, you know, what will be the reaction? So we started playing drumming, and we're, we start with the drums. And no no immediate reaction. And then after a while, we get more active part, and I hear, Olay! Olay! <laughs> I think, wow, this is great. They don't know who I am. They don't know my name. They don't care. They like it. <laughs> so that's the most important thing in the world. That's mm -hmm. why we love Johann Sebastian Bach, because anybody <laughs> who isn't deaf will react to that. I played it for musicians mm -hmm. in Africa, and they liked it. Mm -hmm. So, the answer to your question is absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I cannot understand how someone could not care about that. And I don't know anyone, musician or composer, who doesn't care about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carol, it's it's evident, but you know, you are being a um, trans transgressor or transgressor. How, how is the word in English? Transgressor. Translated? Translated? A transgressor. Okay, uh, uh, you are a transgressor of the of the main lines in uh, uh, vanguardist music. Pierre Boulez and uh, Arnold Schomburg, etc., etc. Do you have uh, this um, this conscience or, or this conscience of of uh, be a little rebel? in this uh, panoramic world of the music? Well, when I was a music student in 1950s, as you probably know or remember, the dominant music was the music of Boulez and Stockhausen and John Cage. And these are all great composers. But, uh, the, the music, particularly of, of Stockhausen and Boulez, is something I can appreciate the craftsmanship, the excellence of the construction, but emotionally, mm -hmm. it's not me. Uh, before that generation, there was the war between Stravinsky and Schoenberg, right? Well, I was on the Stravinsky side. <laughs> Schoenberg is a great composer. <laughs> Berg is a great composer. Webern was the, the god for, for Boulez and Stockhausen. But uh, for me, emotionally, I was drawn to the early ballets of Stravinsky, Rite of Spring, was changed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I did not, as a student, say, uh, you know, I'm going to have a revolution. No, I just thought, I can't spend my life, if I became a composer because I love Stravinsky and I love Bach and I love John Coltrane and I love Miles Davis and I love African music and I love Balani, I can't spend my life writing 12-tone music. Mm -hmm. I studied with Luciano Berio, a very fine musician and a very, very lovely person, very good person. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, like Bob Dylan said, it ain't me, babe. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did not make a, 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 a political statement. I simply started to do what I love to do. And I was not the only one. Arvo Paert went through a similar... I wrote 
terrible 12 tone pieces <laughs> because I, I had to, I was a student. So I, I think this is, I don't think that anyone uh, succeeds musically by making a political statement. I think they succeed by doing what it is they were given a gift, a gift from God to do that job, to do that particular work. And uh, to discover that is, is the biggest gift. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful, One, wonderful response. Okay. Okay, Pedro Pablo Camara, you have some uh, questions about your your works, the work you, you are performing. Hi, Mr. Wright. Thank you so much. Uh, I will come back to New York Counterpoint because in our version we will play in the concert, we do a double transcription. On the one hand, we play with a saxophone instead of clarinet with the ensemble, and in, in other hand, we, we play with 11 saxophones instead of 10 voices pre-recorded. Pre so in the compositional process, um, Mr. Wright, did you think about the possibility of the transcription? No, not at all. I was writing for clarinet, it was for clarinet. But, but I, I know with many pieces of mine, if you have a piece for one instrument, the notes are on paper. So if you play, use other instruments, you just change the timbre. So uh, I, I, I wasn't thinking about it. No, when I wrote it, I just wrote it for clarinet. Of course. And one of the challenges of the piece is uh, the, the sound result of the original version. Uh, how do you feel? So is for you important to try to to play, to find the quality of the different performance as uh, in the original piece is recorded by one performer. So the ensemble, the ensemble should play like one performer or we can achieve of the, of the different possibilities of the people, the different people. Are you, I'm not sure I understand your question. Are you asking me what it is like for a for you to play against the tape of Richard Stoltzman, that kind of question? Or Evans applause? So it is, oh, yeah, the question is if it's important for you to try to, to be the same uh, performer with 11 performers as in the original piece, or because it's an ensemble, we can have different kind of personalities. Well, you, you, you will naturally have different, uh, different sounds, but if you're all playing clarinets, it's okay. If you're playing clarinets and saxophones, I don't know what to tell you. You'll send me a, send me a recording, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> then it, no, won't no, be I, on this, it won't be on this program. <laughs> no, I ask you because we try always to have the same articulation, same sound, of course, tempo, also gestural movements to have the same approach, no? That is why I question that. My question is, is this. Well, I mean, basically, if, uh, if you, uh, With, within, within normal mu musical practice, uh, players will, you know, more or less try to adapt to each other in the ensemble. So uh, th that has never been a problem uh, in, in my experience. I, I tell you the truth, I have not heard many performances of all clarinets. A few, a few. Uh, and usually in the school, because then you have lots of students. And uh, in my experience, the problem was uh, that you couldn't hear the soloist. And uh, they wouldn't amplify, which was a mistake. If you're going to do it live, I think the soloist has to have a little bit of, of amplification, not just so we, we can hear them uh, uh, against all uh, so many uh, other players right behind them. Beyond that, you know, and about the disposition of the stage, because we play in a round and the, the soloist, the main voice, the live voice, we, we play in, in one of the, in the corners. 
So we play in the middle of, in front of, of the audience? The soloist should be heard. So you put them in the position where they can be heard. Mm -hmm. Gen generally speaking, that would be in the middle and downstage, close to the audience. Mm -hmm. But in, if it's an unusual room, I don't know, you know. Yeah. But you want them to be heard. And whatever works, that's what you do. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I have uh, one little question. Okay, because you vindicate popular inspiration in Bartok, Stravinsky, and in jazz. Um, how do you feel that time um, has proved you were right? Because you are one of the. Yes, because in some occasions you told that Schomburg lifted a, an artificial wall that minimized these roots. Uh, how do you feel that um, the world and the time has proved you were right in your postulations? Well, let's be clear. Schoenberg will, will live as long as musicians play uh, music. He's a great composer, Arnold Schoenberg. But if you were to go to a, a list of performances around the world, you would find less of him and more of Stravinsky. That doesn't, that ultimately, uh, it, maybe it doesn't matter, but uh, it, it's, it's just uh, a fact. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to be a composer in residence at Carnegie Hall in New York City. And they asked me, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'd like to present a series of concerts called Three Generations. And uh, the three generations were, number one, my own generation, uh, Terry Riley, uh, Phil Glass, uh, John Adams, a little bit younger, Arvo Paert. Second generation, uh, the people 20 years younger, uh, the bang on a can generation, uh, David Lang, uh, Julia Wolf, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Gordon, and many others of that age. Uh, uh, and the third generation, people 20 years younger than them, uh, Nico Muley uh, and uh, Carolyn Shaw, and um, I'm, I'm forgetting uh, some other names. And uh, the, what, what made me feel very good about it is that my generation, we were all different. The bang on a can generation was very interested in, also Louis Andreessen in my generation, was interested in this, but they took it somewhere else. The Nico Muley generation that, that or were then in their late 30s, not quite 40, they listened to both these generations and they went forward. So there was some continuity, some continuation of these ideas. My generation, the generation of Arbo Peret and, and Glass and Adams and myself, we had to, we didn't have to, but we faced a break in Western music between increasing complexity harmonically, increasing chromatic uh, harmony, or stopping that at the 12 tone serial point and saying basta, because we just wanted to change. The following generations did not make that generational break. They continued on because they liked what preceded them. Now, I think this is true in America. It's true uh, in most of the English speaking countries. I don't think it's as true uh, in so far as I know in Europe, but you are a better judge of that than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, here in um, European conservatories, for example, uh, it seems that uh, Pierre Boulez and Stockhausen and John Cage are main authors in analysis, in harmony, etc., etc. Um, I don't know if in the States is different with it. 
I think so. I think you are more analyzed in, in the States because in Europe we have many pedantic uh, professors <laughs> and they have abstract ideas and non, non real uh, ideas about music and communication. What we admire of your music is the, um, the role of communication, of interaction with people. And this is an ideal uh, very forgotten in uh, other aesthetics. So, my, um, my condolences. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but uh, things are changing. Things are changing. Uh -huh. I, I am sure that you have some young composers who are listening to rock and roll and hip hop and who knows what. <laughs> And um, I'm sure we will hear from them. And they will also know all about 12 tone and serial music as well, and aleatoric music as well. We have a new generation. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's see. Uh, oh gosh, I can't. Uh, his name, the guitar player. I give you an example of two different musicians. One of them is uh, one the American. His name is Bryce Desner. He's living in Paris. Uh, he is uh, trained uh, as a classical guitar player and composer. But um, he also formed a band called The National, which has become very, very famous and very successful with his brother. And he is a completely professional rock and roll star and an international com a successful composer with recordings on Deutsche Grammophon. Second case, Johnny Greenwood. He's the guitarist and keyboard player with Radiohead, one of the most important uh, rock and roll groups ever to exist. And he was originally a violist. He reads music just fine. He writes music for the films, very successful. Uh, in the Bang on a Can All-Stars group there, uh, the leader is Mark Stewart. Mark Stewart is a cellist, graduated from Eastman Academy in uh, New York State. And then also as a hobby, on, for fun, he played the guitar. He came to New York City when he graduated the conservatory, and he found he could make a living as a guitarist who could read music. So he's a completely avant-garde star in the Bang on a Can All-Stars, and he plays music director for Paul Simon and tours the world and makes much more money than you or I. <laughs> so this is a new generation of musicians. They don't say I have to be just a classical musician, just a rock and roll musician. As a percussionist, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I'm addressing the percussionist here. Because percussionists live in two worlds. They can play concerts and they can play in a, in a, in a club. So I think uh, this is a very healthy, good situation. And we will see what the results are. So you were an inspiration for progressive rock composers like Brian, Brian Eno or King Crimson, the group King Crimson. How do you feel with these connections with progressive rock? Well, I, I am very proud. I'm delighted. I, I had a conversation just a few days ago with Brian Eno about uh, his his uh, great uh, learning that he got from It's Gonna Rain, the very first tape piece in 1965. Um, and on the other hand, John Adams, one of our greatest composers, uh, uh, is always say the influence that he got from drumming and other early pieces of mine. So... Uh, I mean, that's wonderful. It's, it's nice to get a good review in the newspaper, but it's better to have great musicians say, thank you, I like your music. I learned something from it. That's the most wonderful compliment you can get. Okay. I agree. I agree. Um, maestros, Juanjo, Pedro Pablo. I think it's a good moment to speak about groove. <laughs> about? Groove. The groove. 
the group. Oh, okay. the group. The group. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking about all these musicians. Okay. That's a question also. I don't know if I I know to, I will I will do a good question in, in that case, but it, it seems for me that uh, for the, the classical musicians, the bar is some very important thing. For example, for me, I, I like very much to mm, get on the bar on the last movement of the quartet, of the mallet quartet, because there are five, eight, two, four, six, eight, seven, eight. So I, I believe, I don't know if you are agree, but uh, I like to make, you know, to make some uh, uh, getting down on the beat, you know, on the earth. And in the first movement, it's more on the pattern, no? Because if you do on the, on the bar, uh, we lose the groove, no? Right, absolutely true. Uh, you want to, I mean, with, with the changing meters, uh, it's, uh, you, know, you don't have to, you count the twos and the threes. You don't have to count seven, eight, five, eight. You know, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two. You, you, want, you want to make a, a, a musical whole out of it. And the, the, the meter sign, five, eight, seven, eight, is you need it. But really, if you just see, oh, this is three, two, three, two, you could put triangles and, and, and straight lines and get the same and a better result just reading across, not getting hung up at the bar. And uh, uh, so you're absolutely right. You want to be able to move across all, all great music. Orlando de Lassus in the, in the Renaissance is floating across. We, there, is no, there is no bar line. So we, we, we uh, th that's, that's an ideal it's to just, the music goes. The bar lines are there to help you uh, learn the piece. But they, don't, they are not stop signs at each corner. <laughs> I say also that because once I was playing drumming, uh, you know, I like very much to do. But, when we have to do the face, uh -huh. <laughs> the, the face, el desfase, la traducción es desfase, el face. Yeah, face. yeah because it's a technical thing that... Uh, also, if somebody told me, you don't have to, to you don't have to, to do in the one, taka -tan -tan, taka -tan -tan, you have to do taka -tan -tan, taka -tan -tan, taka -tan -tan, taka because like that, we can understand more the face. Is that true? Absolutely. I, uh, when, when I was, when I am playing in drumming, I am the one who phases, who moves ahead. I mean, somebody has to stay put and somebody yes. has to move. Yes, yes, yes. So, so I'm nervous and yes, I, move I move ahead, right? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> we know who the phases are. I am the one moving. <laughs> <laughs> So we are both cursed, right? <laughs> so, so uh, the 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 uh, the difficulty, the virtuosity of the phasing is: can you control it? Can you? Because it's like a vacuum cleaner. The, the the next downbeat is saying, "You must come to me," and we say, "Wait, slowly, slowly, slowly," <laughs> and that is difficult to do. That is very difficult to do, and you can't be thinking about downbeats. When we, my ensemble, was first learning drumming, mm -hmm. the most common question was, where is one? <laughs> <laughs> and that's good. That means we were really playing it well. And, and it's good for the listener, for the audience. They don't, they don't know, because to be in the music, um, ba, ba, um, ba, ba, um, everybody walking out of the hall, they're bored. But mm -hmm. if, you, if there's just this con continuously moving and constantly changing Six. rhythmic uh, relationship, then you are glued to listen. What's going on? Mm -hmm. You, you have you. it right. Yeah, thank you very much. I did, what, first time I did with a lot of tempo, Right. when I was changing, I, I was trying to change also the beat, the, the, oh. the, the one beat. 
and was too much. Was tactic, Absolutely. tactic, tactic, tactic. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's as if your hands are doing something and you just get them a little bit faster and, and you yourself don't really know where one is. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So it's, yes, we can be floating more. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. <laughs> thank you. It will help. It will help. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Algo más, Pedro? A very small question, very uh, nothing. No, I'm, it's I'm just answering your the... questions. <laughs> no, it's, are, it's are, very are small. You, are, are, you, are you playing saxophone or clarinet or both? Uh, saxophones. Right. Saxophones. Yeah. And we, do, we will play with the 11 saxophones with students here. Oh, good. That, that was, yeah. a, uh, was arranged for, for all saxophones. It works very well. Yeah, we play it from soprano till baritone. Right. Yeah. And I would like to ask you a, a, a little bit about the many people play a little cesure, a small break between movements. No. I don't know. No. Uh, okay. No, you really That's want to hear. Yeah. There's, yeah. In my music, it's. I think Tehalim has a break between movements, but basically. All the pieces, it's that attacker, you just go straight through. You change tempo, but you keep going. That's clear, that's clear. Ma Maestro, one, one experience I had when I was playing drumming for one hour, it was the overtones. We yeah, created. right. That's um, like Shinakis, we did, he did in, 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 in um, uh, the play arts. He, you know, he invented some instrument, metal instrument, and you can, you could hear. Uh, but this, uh, this, uh, how do you how do you thought about that? I mean, for me, the idea is when the block and spill, they play. It's just another another wall. It's something like crazy thing, amazing, you know? uh, And people listen more of that sometimes that that they that they than the notes, no? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. When I was uh, working on the marimba section, See? I was playing marimba and recording myself and playing it back, <laughs> playing against the recording, <laughs> overdubbing. See? And I began to hear women's voices. Ah, uh, see. And I see, thought, see. no drugs, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> no more drugs. <laughs> so, so I began to realize the marimba is pitched around the frequency, the upper re of the female voice. See, so see. the overtones and the, and, the, and, the, and the fundamentals combine to give you the audio illusion of a woman's voice. So I then called up uh, Joan LaBarbera and the original singers, and I said, come on over for rehearsal. I think there's a vocal part in mm -hmm. drumming part two. See. And what, what I said, I said, now you, we, I just made a loop of the different relationships, one, one eighth note ahead, two eighth notes ahead. And I said, write down or start singing what you hear. The result, the result of this combination of, of, of different, of the same pattern in different rhythmic positions. And we, the singers and myself, began to sing, write down these, which became the vocal. The vocal part. part. Ah. Exactly. Because it's really there it is really part of the combination if you write all the notes out on one staff you will see oh well here's that melody if you like and here's another one if you prefer and so on and so forth and the same thing with the glockenspiels only there it's so high the only way you could you have to whistle that's so, because of the whistle player <laughs> yeah I, I can't do it so well anymore i, I used to do it and because you can you can no longer sing so high. It's impossible to sing so high. And then I began to hear, well, wait a minute. If you had a piccolo, you could play those same oh. resulting patterns that are acoustically really there from the result of all this mixing together. But you know another thing, which I know too, as a player, when you're playing the glockenspiels, in the audience, it's jingle bells. <laughs> by you, it's knives in your ears. <laughs> it could be painful. <laughs> Yes, totally. Oh, that's uh, so. So that's why uh, you're using microphones also, uh, well, just to. Yeah, uh, because the the, 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 the drums are, are naturally the loudest, 
then the marimbas need some, and the glockenspiels in the audience can be very quiet. And so uh, we, we, you want to have all the sound of the piece of drumming all coming from the same sound source. So amplification is not is to make balance. Also, mm -hmm. you could not you could not. The women are singing. You know, it's not Wagner. You have to sing very quietly, but you have to be heard. So it's acoustically necessary to amplify the voices in in the marimba section in drumming. It's part of the instrumentation. So in other words, here's another way to think about it. What instrument did Miles Davis play? Hanson, does anybody know? Trumpet. What instrument did Miles Davis play? Anybody? Trumpet. Trumpet. Oh, not really. He played flugelhorn. A flugelhorn, yeah. Wait, wait. With a Harmon mute ah, and, a mi and, a, and a microphone. And without the flugelhorn and the Harmon mute and the microphone, no Miles Davis. No Miles Davis, yeah. So that's orchest that's instrumentation or orchestration 20, 20th, 21st century. And that's what I'm talking about in drumming. See, The microphone is not, uh, oh, uh, rock and roll. No, it's like, otherwise we can't, it's part of the piece. It's timbre. It's timbre. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maestro. Thank you. <laughs> Are we free to go? <laughs> 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 See. Or are we Thank you. Now maybe we are prisoners of Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> this pandemia, we are prisoners of Zoom in this we live, pandemia. <laughs> we are. We are in, in, inhabitants of Zoom. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you so much, Maestro Reich. Well, to my to my fellow prisoners, thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> you are a person full of abundance, full of richness, and thank you for all these sounds, these lights you gifted to the world and to to the art. And to real life. This is the solemn goodbye for this meeting. Goodbye. We need to to tell this. Okay. Well, it's much. I've enjoyed this a lot. This is the best <laughs> Zoom I've had in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, okay. Maestro. We would like to have you. Sometimes very we soon will. here. We uh, can, I hope when, when we can when we can move like human beings, it will be great, right? When we can play music live on stage, <laughs> that's what we want. <laughs> Hopefully. Pues, queridos amigos, queridas amigas, desde el Festival de las Artes de Castilla y León y el Instituto de Investigaciones Artísticas Catarina Gurska, queremos agradecer inmensamente al maestro Steve Wright, a Juanjo Guillén, a Pedro Pablo Cámara y a todos los que habéis estado escuchando. Ha sido interesantísimo profundizar en la obra de, de este autor tan decisivo, tan importante. Y ojalá que podamos disfrutar con más gusto, con más entusiasmo, con más conocimiento las obras que nos esperan en este festival. Así que ánimo, éxito a los dos maestros que tenemos aquí que participarán en este festival y eh, eh, Steve, que tengas una vida muy larga, muy abundante, llena de buenos frutos y de buenos dones para, para todo el mundo. <risa> <risa> Oh, Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, bye. 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 bye.